In 2021, um, the chief coroner, Heather Jones, reported that um, since 2016, 54 Yukoners lost their lives, so that put us at the highest per capita rate of deaths in the entire country, and that number has actually gone up. So um, in January, Minister Tracy Ann McPhee declared a substance use emergency. Um, in the first three months of 2022, the Yukon substance use death rate increased to 74.4 per 100,000, so three times the national average. So this is a very... Um, this is a problem that, is, that is, exists across the country, but is uh, something that the Yukon has been particularly hard hit by. Um, and, and increasingly, I think we're starting to see more benzodiazepines entering the, the toxic drug supply with fentanyl, resulting in more difficult to treat and reverse o overdoses. So I, I suspect we're going to continue to just be impacted by this crisis um, ongoing, unfortunately. Um, I think the Yukon has a unique landscape. We, you know, we've been really blessed to get some speakers coming in from out of the territory. Um, um, one thing that I think um, is worth taking a look at is just some of the things that make us unique, make the Yukon um, unique. Um, you know, we, when we're when we're dealing with the problem of how to uh, treat the opioid crisis, um, something we need to keep in mind is that our alcohol use rate, like poly substance use, is a big issue for the Yukon. Our alcohol use rates are way above the national average. So if you look at um, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, um, you know, data shows that we have four times the national average of um, hospitalizations due to alcohol-related harms. Um, we have very high crack and cocaine use with relatively low rates of crystal meth compared to other jurisdictions. Um, and we have very significant rates of people who use multiple substances often at the same time which increases your risk of overdose and, and has implications for treatments that are available um, or that would be recommended. So we see a lot of mixed alcohol and stimulant and opioid use here. Um, our drug supply uh, locally, I mean, it, it vir there's virtually no heroin anymore. It's, it's um, almost entirely fentanyl if somebody's looking to purchase opioids. Um, we have really inconsistent access to drug supply because we're remote, um, and so uh, substances tend to come into the territory in waves with periods where they're not accessible to patients, which, uh, or to people, sorry, which obviously increases um, risk of overdose as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we're starting to see more contamination of benzodiazepines. Um, we also have a, a population that really, um, you know, if you informally ask our um, people who use opioids how they prefer to use their opioids, I'd say we have a, a high rate of people who choose inhalational versus uh, um, injecting routes. Um, for our demographics, we, you know, 25% of the population of the Yukon is First Nations. Um, and, you know, looking at some data from BC, this is really relevant to the crisis because First Nations people are five times more likely to die of a drug overdose than, you know, someone in the average BC population. And First Nations women in particular are ten times more likely to die than other BC residents. So we're dealing with a very vulnerable population. Um, and, you know, in terms of the actual landscape, like the literal landscape, we are very spread out. We have communities that don't actually have a pharmacy. Um, where people can access certain medications, and that needs to be taken into account when we're when we're looking at our treatments as well. Um, there are a lot of resources that are currently available to Yukoners, and I, I, I think today I'm going to try to focus on some of the positives of things that are in place. And I don't want to give the impression that I feel that we have everything we need and that the problem's solved or anything like that. I just want to sort of talk about some of the things that are available in a bit of a positive light, um, recognizing that there is lots of work to be done. Um, so we have opioid treatment services and the referred care clinic, which I'll talk about. We have a low barrier access and medication coverage for opioid agonist therapy. So anybody, I'll talk a bit more about what that is later, but anybody who wants to, to access opioid agonist therapy has, can, can do that. Um, uh, that. That's not a barrier. That's not something that Yukoners need to, to be concerned with. Um, we have a, a strong take-home naloxone program available throughout the territory. We have supervised consumption site. We, we actually have uh, the capacity for people to inhale their drugs um, at this consumption site, um, which is very unique um, across uh, for, for sites of this type um, and in keeping with the sort of use patterns that we see in the territory. 
We have drug testing sites. We have patient adv advocacy and support via blood ties. And, um, and we have the mental wellness sort of suite of programs like withdrawal management services, intensive treatment programming, and rapid access counseling. So there, there are lots of resources that are available to UConners. I think, I think one of the challenges and things that we need to consider at this summit is how do we integrate all the resources that are available and just make sure people know about them. Um, so I've underlined this one because that's going to be sort of what I'm focusing on next on the presentation here. Um, referred Care Clinic Yukon. So that's where I work since I've moved to the Yukon. Um, it's a primary care clinic for patients with mental health and substance use issues. Um, and really what we try to do at this clinic is provide outreach supports for patients. Um, we have a large interdisciplinary team that's really expanded in the context of the substance use health, health emergency. We now have nine physicians, not like every day, um, but a roster of nine physicians, two nurse practitioners with expertise in addictions medicine. We have an RN, we have two LPNs, um, that's a licensed practical nurse. Um, we have two outreach workers, a community counselor, and recently we've just acquired um, a social worker to the program. So when somebody is referred to the referred care clinic because they need outreach supports, what they get is access to um, sort of a, a a wide interdisciplinary team that can provide some wraparound services. Um, now within Referred Care Clinic is the Opioid Treatment Services Program. So Opioid Treatment Services is essentially a program that is available to anybody with, um, I'll use the medical term, opioid use disorder, um, problematic opioid use, whatever you, people who use opioids, whatever you want to call it. Um, people who want to access uh, medical treatments can essentially refer themselves to the clinic and, and walk in. We have same-day appointments available to people um, every business day. We will see someone for an assessment and initiate treatment um, at the point of first encounter. Um, we, we really work hard to create a, sort of a non-judgmental environment for people who use substances to just be able to trust us to let them know what their goals are and what their, their treatment pattern or their use patterns are and then um, so that we can give them the best possible recommendations um, that, that, we can, that we can come up with with the information. Um, and, uh, and we also more recently have started running an outreach clinic at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we provide telephone consultations to any um, care provider in the Yukon who wants to give us a call. Um, so we frequently uh, liaise with physicians providing care in the hospital, um, with nurses working in the community health centers, um, and um, with the team at Withdrawal Management Services as well to, to provide treatment recommendations. Um, we basically, I think one of the best things about our, our program is that anybody who accesses opioid treatment services, you know, whether they continue to receive medication treatments for opioid use disorder or not, they receive primary care from our clinic. So it's sort of an instant referral pathway for people who tend to be dealing with some very significant either mental health or substance use issues. Um, and again, this is meant to be as low barrier as possible. Um, we also have several uh, options for prescribed opioids that are available. So when people do present to us looking for help, we can try to tailor a treatment option that's sort of in line with their goals and what they're, what they're hoping to, um, to get out of treatment. So that's what I'll talk about next. Um, the main, I think the mainstay treatment that we're offering right now at Opioid Treatment Services is opioid agonist therapy. So opioid agonist therapy is um, essentially um, prescribed uh, safer opioids that can be um, picked up from a pharmacy with a known set dose, um, most of which have very long half-lives, so they stay in your system for a long time rather than sort of wearing out and subjecting people to being in withdrawal often. Um, and and that, that helps in a few different ways. So, um, Opioid agonist therapy has been shown to reduce all-cause mortality for, for people who, are, who use opioids who are on that treatment. Um, it, it helps people reduce their opioid use. It can help people 
eliminate opioid use. So somebody on opioid agonist therapy is less likely to relapse to opioid use if that's, if that's their goal um, when they're on treatment versus just abstinence alone. Um, there's actually a lot of evidence um, for some of the other sort of less predictable harms to opioid agonist therapy as well. Um, there's lower rates of arrest or incarceration for people who are receiving this treatment, lower risk of HIV, hepatitis transmission, um, reduction in risky injecting practices, um, you know, using alone or in, in inconsistent amounts or without drug testing, um, greater likelihood of employment and family relationships, um, and really I think at the end of the day, the thing that all of the, the prescribers at our clinic sort of try to remind ourselves of all the time is that um, people who, who have opioid use disorder, who are receiving opioid agonist therapy, are nearly 3.4 times less likely to die from an overdose than people with opioid use disorder who are not on opioid agonist therapy. So as a physician, you know, we prescribe a lot of medications that have some benefit, but uh, are probably oversold somewhat, um, but I actually, um, I think all of the prescribers at our clinic feel very strongly that this is a, this is a life-saving, potentially life-saving medication that um, should be readily accessible to people um, who want it. Um, um, so um, just so that people know a little bit about the treatments that we're we're prescribing. Um, maybe you work with people who use substances, or maybe you uh, develop programs. Um, I, I think we all come from from a variety of backgrounds here. Um, I I think there is value in, in people being aware of, of the services so that they can help patients to sort of navigate um, navigate all of the resources that are available. So I'm just going to give an overview of the treatments that are that are currently available at Opioid Treatment Services. Um, so the, the main one, I would say, is Suboxone. Um, Suboxone is a long-acting opioid that reduces cravings and prevents opioid withdrawal. It also protects people from an overdose when they're taking it, um, partly because it keeps their tolerance elevated, but it also blocks other opioids, potentially stronger opioids, that could cause an overdose. Um, we, we really like this treatment option for the Yukon because um, it, it sort of fits with the landscape that we described earlier. Um, you know, we're able to give people take-home doses early, meaning that if they need to travel or they, they live in a community remotely and they can't be going to a pharmacy every day, we're able to accommodate that with Suboxone. Um, it is a really long half-life and, you know, life's unpredictable. So if people are unable to um, make it to the pharmacy in a certain time or they just can't access treatment for a while, um, it, it, they get less withdrawal with missed doses. There's less of a potential for abuse. It has lower street value. We're actually seeing that this is, um, this is a medication that, um, you know, is available to people illicitly. I mean, there, there's a market for it, but people are actually purchasing it and using it appropriately. Um, so if they're not able to access um, you know, fentanyl or something, and they're going into withdrawal as a result. There's people who are self-treating themselves with, uh, with Suboxone that they're purchasing um, from, uh, from other people. Um, uh, you can easily transition to more intensive therapy if needed, and this can be started in the clinic at the first visit. We have Suboxone in the, in the clinic. Um, it's not uncommon for somebody to come in and withdrawal or, or just seeking treatment, and for us to have them walk out with... Um, with a vial of medication that um, you know they can start that day, um, and and hopefully start feeling better. Um, just because I made this um, horrible animation, I'm going to make you all watch it. So this is um, this is my little animation of what Suboxone is. So these little beauties here are opioid receptors, hand drawn by yours truly, um, and this is fentanyl. And if we take fentanyl, fentanyl is like an absolute stimulator of the opioid receptor. So we see the receptors are completely stimulated. Now, Suboxone, the little caps over there in the corner, which that's the shape I've arbitrarily chosen for them, when they enter the scene, they knock fentanyl off the receptor, and they only partially stimulate the opioid receptor. Um, and, you know, one of the advantages of this is that they're, they're very safe because they don't 
Suboxone is very safe because it does not fully stimulate the opioid receptor, so the risk of overdose is lower for people taking this treatment. Um, and it blocks that fentanyl. So if somebody does use um, fentanyl again, then less of that fentanyl can actually reach the opioid receptors and cause an overdose. Um, so it protects people from relapses and it prevents some of the cravings that lead to a, to a potential relapse. Um, we also more recently have started offering something called Sublicade. So Sublicade is essentially an injectable Suboxone. Um, it's injected at the clinic by a, by a nurse or a physician. Um, we only introduced this in early 2000, and kind of early this year. Um, and a lot of patients are approaching our clinic who hadn't connected with us before because they're hearing through word of mouth that this is an effective treatment for some of their peers. Um, and essentially, it's a once monthly long acting opioid that's, that's injected. Um, the patient can, doesn't have to go to the pharmacy, doesn't have to deal with picking up any prescriptions. They just come back to our clinic once a month, check in and, and get, a, get their next shot if they choose to continue receiving it. Um, it's a really great option for people, again, who live in communities or live more remotely. So we have some people who, who travel to some remote communities that um, prefer this option because they know that the medication's in their system. Um, and it's also great for people who have trouble storing their medications. We have people who live in the shelter who have, who have trouble, you know, keeping things in their backpack because they're sometimes robbed. Um, and that's not an issue when, you, when your medication is something that you're receiving as an injection once a month. Um, we, one of the, I mean, a, a term that probably everybody's familiar with, with uh, is methadone. So our clinic has offered methadone um, since we sort of took over the uh, existing methadone program in the territory. Um, this is the most extensively studied treatment for opioid use disorder and, and probably for any um, in addiction medicine um, of all medications. It's been used since the 60s. It's a very long acting opioid. Um, it doesn't have a ceiling effect. So um, for people with really high tolerance, like what we're seeing from daily fentanyl injection, we're, we're able to just get, go higher and higher on the dose until we can match their level of tolerance. Um, um, it requires daily witness at the pharmacy, so that sort of limits where we can initiate the treatment. Um, uh, right now, it's, it's only available in, um, in Whitehorse um, because most pharmacies aren't able to, uh, to, to witness medication daily. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I'd say this is one of our, one of our mainstay treatments that a lot of, a lot of patients um, approach us for and, and request specifically. Um, in 2021, we found that the existing guidelines that we were following were a bit too restrictive and maybe didn't fit the Yukon um, situation very well. Um, for instance, if somebody missed three doses, their prescription was cancelled, um, and all our pharmacies, or many of them are closed on the weekends or for long weekends, people travel. Um, so we, we adopted some new guidelines from Ontario to allow more missed doses, much more rapid dose increases. Um, and, uh, and dual therapy with Cadian, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, well, <laughs> right now. So the next uh, treatment is, um, is Cadian. So Cadian, so again, I'm still in the category, these are opioid agonist therapies. So all, these are all long-acting opioids um, that, that can be used instead of um, street opioids. So Cadian is, is, you know, another term for this is slow-release oral morphine. And essentially, it's a capsule of morphine that um, slowly releases over 24 hours. Um, you can, it doesn't build up in someone's system the way that some longer acting drugs like methadone do. Um, so we're able to very quickly increase doses if we need to to get someone out of withdrawal and to, um, to match their tolerance. Um, People, there's very high treatment satisfaction for people who are receiving Cadian. I, I think a big piece of that is because it's, it's, it's such an effective painkiller. So many people who use opioids have a reason why they use opioids, and a, a really common reason is chronic pain. And so this is sort of one of those treatments where if somebody struggles with chronic pain in addition to opioid cravings, then we, we can offer this as an option that'll, that'll actually um, be effective at treating their pain as well. Um, and that helps with, with retention and, and all of those benefits we talked about earlier when someone's on treatment. Um, more recently, we've actually started um, combining Cadian with methadone. So fentanyl has really changed the substance use landscape. Um, you know, we're seeing higher tolerance than, 
or we're seeing people who, are, who have higher tolerance than ever before and, and are needing more aggressive treatments just to feel comfortable and they're asking us for more aggressive treatments. Um, and one of the treatments that we were able to come up with is a combination of um, Cadian and methadone. I say able to come up with, but we, we look to guidance documents from, um, from Ontario for this. So um, we've only been doing this since November 2021. Um, we essentially, it's, it's sort of the best of both worlds for methadone and Cadian. We can increase the Cadian dose very quickly up front to get somebody feeling more comfortable and out of withdrawal. Um, and then more gradually and more safely, we can increase their methadone um, to be sort of a more, more sustainable treatment um, long term for them. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it's, it's been quite good for people with really high tolerance um, who, who just did not feel that our previous treatments were matching what they needed. Um, the, uh, so those are, those are our, our oat um, therapies, essentially. Uh, that's, my, that's my summary of the different, of the different options. Um, just so that people know where oat is available in the territory. Um, as I said, Opioid Treatment Services, which is located at 210 Elliott Street next to the CBC building, anybody can show up um, and just see a doc same day um, to initiate treatment if that's something they're interested in. Um, Kwanlin Dunn Health Center, it's my understanding that the docs there um, are, are able to initiate opioid agonist therapy as well. Um, patients who are at withdrawal management or intensive treatment programs, that's a program that's all through mental wellness and so, um, care teams there connect patients to the prescribers at opioid treatment services so that we can connect with them about initiating OAT if, they, if they'd like. Um, all of the docs who work at the Whitehorse Correctional Center can initiate OAT. Um, this is such a, a probably underrated and critical sort of treatment intervention for, for Whitehorse Correctional Center because we know that overdose rates post-discharge from corrections are exceptionally high for people who aren't receiving OAT because they've essentially lost all their tolerance while in corrections and then they go back to, to this unsafe drug supply. Um, and so people who are receiving OAT at, at corrections, are, they, they're much safer at discharge, even if they don't continue with the treatment. Um, Dawson City and Watson Lake Medical Clinics and Hospitals, we've been working with the docs in, in both of those settings and they're, um, they're all able to provide some of the forms of OAT that I've described above. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the really great examples of collaboration um, is we've got a, a patient who is living in Watson Lake who was on sublocade and we were really worried, like that's the injectable treatment, we were worried they, when they moved to Watson Lake that they wouldn't be able to continue their treatment. We called the doctors there and they were so eager to just support this patient and they actually took courses and learned how to provide sublocade. Um, sort of on the fly, um, and the person didn't even miss a dose. So, yeah, there's so many opportunities for collaboration. Um, and then more recently, um, the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter has become one of the areas where the, the clinic works. I mentioned that we have an outreach clinic um, out of the emergency shelter. This is uh, the unglamorous view of what it looks like. Um, so every Monday and Thursday, we have a physician and an outreach nurse who... Um, who go to the shelter and essentially run a sort of walk-in clinic for um, anybody who's interested in opioid agonist therapy um, and any of the referred care clinic patients who have primary care issues. Um, we have been able to connect with, um, this is a really exciting program actually, we, we've been able to connect with a lot of patients who were RCC patients who we just never saw because we weren't meeting them in their space. Um, and more importantly, I think that we've been able to connect with people who use opioids who were interested in treatment but just didn't know about our programming um, but but are suddenly you know now that we're where they where they live and sleep and, and eat they um, they're aware of the programming that's available and so we had a, a big upswing in in intakes of people who um, were connected with our program and some of them continue to receive treatment some of them don't but at least they've gotten some primary care and will continue to get primary care so this is a program that we're really like really proud of um, and you know really we kind of realize that all you need is a laptop and and, a, and some providers and you can you can start a clinic pretty much anywhere um, that bed there I mean we there's a 
can't see it in the photo, but there's some some cots that people sleep in at the shelter that we you know treated a an over a life threatening overdose uh, of a patient that we were seeing. We've sutured, sutured up split lips and and like some pretty big cuts from patients who couldn't wait around to be seen in the eMERGE because um, um, just because of, of um, their, uh, it, was, it was easier for them to be seen at the clinic, let's just say, let's say that. Um, and um, yeah, we've, anyways, it's a good program. I'm happy about it. I could talk about it all day, but I'm gonna move on. Um, so just in terms of parting remarks, um, and, I, and I am hoping that people ask questions or even provide suggestions. I think that's probably the most important use of our time here. Um, I do want to say that um, opioid agonist therapy is first-line therapy for people who use opioids, and it saves lives. Um, and there's just no question about that. The, the, the evidence is there to support that, this statement. Um, and you know what, I, I, I believe it's, it's a fundamental human right to be able to access that care. Um, and I think it should be available everywhere. And, um, I think one of the one of the Yukon's challenges that we need to overcome is that, you know, currently there's a there's a lack of pharmacies in communities, um, so there isn't ready access for for um, opioid agonist therapy everywhere. So that's something that we can definitely improve. Um, I think I think criminalization and stigmatization cause additional harm for people who use drugs. I think it, it causes unnecessary harm. Um, you know, we, we're seeing that BC has has successfully secured an exemption um, to uh, to the the criminalization or for the decriminalization of drugs for personal use, um, and I and I think that that's something that you know we could be working towards here, and that's definitely something that has support from the Yukon Medical Association and various other patient advocacy groups, um, and then maybe the the most relevant to uh, to this presentation. Medications for opioid use disorder, it, it's only a part of a person's treatment or recovery, or maybe they don't want to stop using and maybe it's just part of their harm reduction. Um, I, I fully acknowledge that it's just one small piece of the pie. Um, the only kind of message I, I just want to impart to this, to this group, because this is a summit, these are the leaders of our, um, of our community, um, is just th these treatments are are really only available if people know about them. So if you can if you can help me in communicating that some of these treatments are available, that they're low barrier, and that really, if somebody just wants to get an opinion from a physician, they can walk into our clinic. Um, I, I think that that could do a lot of a lot of good for people who may not be aware of of that resource. I'm going to tack one on here, just given the 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 thread of the conversations we've been seeing today. But I I think. I think it's awesome that we are focusing on opioid use, and, and it's you know so so important given the harms that we're seeing. And I um, I just I was really excited by some of the presentations we were seeing today that also talked about um, you know safe safe access to alcohol um, via managed alcohol program. And I just want to put in my pitch so that I think that that would be something that'd be really beneficial to the territory as well. I think I. Hopefully, kept uh, to our to our schedule here, and just sort of went through this fairly quickly. So, if if people want to run, you are free. <laughs> You've made it to the end of the summit. If you want to ask questions, um, or you know, this sparks some discussion. If you disagree with me, whatever, um, please feel free to grab a microphone and. That's right. The, yeah, that's right. It's just it's. Base camp. You haven't quite meet, reached the summit yet. Um, I think I saw someone's hand up. Hey. Exactly. Yeah. There. There. This is just not well known, and I and I think it's because there was a chat like. RCC is a primary care clinic, um, and that just happens to be where a lot of the addictions medicine in the territory happens. Opioid treatment services needed to run as a separate program because we work with people who have a family doctor. It couldn't be a primary care clinic as well. But I think in our attempt to be clear with the naming, we've kind of muddied the waters a little bit. So 
if we want to keep it simple, anybody with opioid use disorder who wants opioid agonist therapy or an assessment from a physician can show up at RCC without an appointment. They're welcome to call first. It's always great, but they don't have to, and they will be seen by a physician or nurse practitioner. <clears throat> that um, the, the referral for the walk-in nature of opioid treatment services is only for opioid use disorder. Um, there are referral criteria for a uh, referred care clinic. Um, right now, um, any, any nurse at mental wellness and substance use can refer to a referred care clinic, so that's one of the ways that we probably get connected with the most clients. Um, any psychiatrist can refer, and anybody who's been admitted to hospital for any reason um, can be referred to the clinic. The criteria is that we only accept people with active mental health or active substance use conditions, um, but, uh, but we, 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 try to, um, we try to be as, as kind of open and, and receptive to taking in um, new patients who, who meet, those, meet, meet the mandate of the clinic. Are there, yeah. What's that? It would, yeah, yeah, it would. It would. Um, heroin, heroin is um, heroin is a form um, is an opioid, and that's kind of largely been replaced by fentanyl, which is even a more stronger, more more dangerous opioid. There's not quite as much heroin um, in the territory now. It's mostly been replaced by fentanyl, just because it's so easy to produce and, and transport. Um, but, uh, but essentially those are both opioid medications, and so OAT would 100% work for both of those, any, anybody who uses either of those substances. Is the Yukon prepared for heroin? I think so. Um, I. Truthfully, um, heroin is almost more predictable than, than it's, it's almost less dangerous than fentanyl. Um, you know, I, it's a weird thing to say, but if we could choose heroin or fentanyl, I think, I think that you would, you'd almost prefer a, a drug supply of, of heroin rather than the very unpredictable, very dangerous fentanyl that we currently have. Um, but right now, with, with um, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of resources that were added to the, to the opioid treatment services program, and um, we, we have just sort of gradually been scaling up um, what we're able to provide since the beginning of the year, and I, I see that we're continuing with that direction. So hopefully that answers your question. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Um, Hydromorphone, hydromorphone is one that, so I, I obviously didn't kind of focus on that treatment for this presentation. Hydromorphone is one of the options of prescribed opioids, um, often sort of referred to as safer supply. Um, it's available at the clinic. Right now we are trying to find ways to limit the potential harms to the to the community at large um, by prescribing it in cases where we have guidance from a, an addiction specialist, um, sort of very case by case, um, where we are prescribing it. Um, and it's part of the suite of treatments, I guess you could say, like uh, for prescribed opioids, um, but uh, it, it is available currently, and we have, we have a few patients who are receiving the, the prescriptions for hydromorph currently. You're welcome. Does anybody have any, this seems like a great opportunity to receive feedback. Does anybody have any suggestions for, for me to take back to the clinic? Or do we just want to go <laughs> and be? Okay, well, if ever you want to, um, I don't have my contact info on here, but um, if, you, um, if you ever do want to connect and learn a bit more about the programming at Opioid Treatment Services, then um, I, I'm, not, I'm not hard to find. And um, thanks, for, thanks for your time. 
I, yeah, thank you. <laughs>